Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, as you can tell by the much, much more attractive host, that uh, Mike is not here tonight. And uh, I'll be uh, kicking off our meeting tonight. Mike is currently on an overseas trip. And Tony, I believe, is still overseas on a family event. So uh, he asked me if I'd get the meeting started and introduce our host, um, or our um, guest speaker tonight. Uh, just to get started off, as you know, a couple of the major events coming up. We have our gala coming up here on Veterans Day up in D.C. I'm not sure how many of you are going to be attending, but uh, if so, it should be a, a quite a good time. And if you need any more information on that, uh, it's on our new website. If any of you have seen that, I'm gonna, actually, I can put that in the... Um, everybody in the meeting, I'm going to type in the address to our uh, new website, vpca.vet, and that's uh, where we're going to be directing most of our traffic to. We'll still keep the prostatecancer.org, veteransprostatecancer.org email addresses, but we're going to start directing all of our major um, website traffic to this new address. A little easier to uh, remember, and uh, our new uh, Skyline Media, who's been taking over our um, all the advertising and media, and they're doing a phenomenal job. All the uh, great looking stuff on the website. The new uh, public service announcement video is there. They see a very attractive girl. It pops up on the uh, rolling advertisement. Click on that and watch the video. That's the one that's going to be going our new What's Your Number campaign that uh, we're shopping out to uh, national media outlets to um, as a pilot. And if it gets picked up and um, it's well received, we have a whole series of very similar uh, themed videos that we'd like to do over the next couple of years as we get uh, more public uh, interest and um, awareness of the PSA process. Also, the rolling, uh, the banner that you'll see on the website also has the, this advertisement for 50 vets and also talks about the uh, event in uh, D.C. here in a few weeks. So uh, please check it out and direct everybody to it. All the business cards and uh, media will be uh, pointing at this new address. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to um, uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Cohen tonight. He's going to be talking to us about the uh, new genetic testing uh, that's, and that's coming down the uh, uh, industry for uh, newly diagnosed patients. Um, I will let him introduce himself. The only thing I can say is uh, I see that he had uh, he was at Ohio State for quite a while, so I won't say anything bad about him because this uh, Penn State uh, Penn State uh, family that I live in will be going up to the game this weekend, and we need all the good karma we can have. They're playing Ohio State uh, in Beaver, uh, Beaver uh, Stadium this weekend, so I will be there hoping our Nittany Lions can prevail. Uh, over in, over to um, uh, Dr. Cohen to uh, talk about his, uh, his topic tonight. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. And, and don't worry. Actually, even though I spent time at Ohio State, I am not a fan um, and got in trouble when I was at Ohio State for wearing a Michigan hat uh, for the Ohio State Michigan weekend. Um, got Yeah. So uh, I'll be rooting for Penn State um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see Ohio State go down. I think that was because I was the urologist for the Ohio State football team and uh, was on beck and call you know, for the team for my entire tenure there, but um, I want to thank you for, for having me tonight. And um, just a quick little background about me. I know it was in the, uh, in the email, but uh, I am a, uh, as I call myself, a um, reformed urologist. Um, I practice urology uh, clinically for about 26 years, mostly at, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, but I did spend some time in uh, academic medicine at Ohio state. Yes. Um and uh, so if anybody's from uh, the North Carolina area, you know, I'm right around the corner. Um, I did grow up, though, mostly in Boston um, and moved, unfortunately, to Long Island because I am a Bostonian through and through. So if there are any Bostonians in there, um, you feel the pain for the Red Sox, but I think and the Patriots probably this year, but going forward. Um, I left um, clinical medicine uh, several years ago. And I uh, joined Myriad Genetics as the medical director, um, primarily because of what was happening in, in the field of prostate cancer uh, and how it was evolving and changing. And it was seemed to me it was a good area to go into so I could hopefully impact uh, more people's lives. Um, I did treat prostate cancer for a long time, whether it was um, just newly diagnosed or uh, even advanced prostate cancer and, and ran our advanced prostate cancer uh, 
center at our practice. During this, please feel free to ask questions, uh, whether in the chat or just call out. Um, this is really informal. Uh, we don't have a big group. Um, I tend to talk very quickly when I do presentations to hopefully not bore you to death on some of this information, uh, but to really kind of um, address the issues that are, are the most important. Um, I won't go into the heavy science of it um, unless you want me to and go ahead and ask if you would like me to explain more about that. I'm really happy to do that. Um, so I'm going to say the, the famous words that started several years ago. I'm going to share my screen. Um, hopefully this will work. And uh, if you just let me know, do you see the um, presentation? Great. Okay. So I'm going to talk tonight. I'm going to talk tonight specifically about a test called the Polaris test. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, some of you probably never heard of it and tell you why we developed it and uh, what it does and how it helps um, men with prostate cancer. Um, the problem that faces urologists when they diagnose a man with prostate cancer is that you have certain information that you can use to decide what's the best form of treatment and what's the likelihood the treatment will be successful. And this usually comes down to the biopsy that is done, um, the PSA test, um, as well as you know the, the exam, uh, the prostate exam. And we use those different findings and we try to figure out what's the best way to go about treating it. What's the most important part of that though is what the pathology is when you do the biopsy. The problem is, um, as many of you probably know, the biopsy samples, although painful when, you know, when you know, gained or addressed, um, they're very small and it's very difficult to get a good read on them. And as you can see, the big number in the, in the side of the slide here, 55%. And what that means is that if you have um, pathology on a slide, that only about half the time <clears throat> will two different pathologists give you the same answer. So it's really difficult to understand how to use that information to really get a good idea on how to treat. Because it's very important to know what, how aggressive is the tumor? And uh, if it's more aggressive, should I treat it more aggressively? Is it going to help? And so the pathology itself is not the best answer. That led um, Myriad Genetics to develop the Polaris test. The Polaris test was, is it looks at the genes of the cell. Um, and it looks at the, specifically at the genes that control the cell growth and division. And the thought is cells that are more actively dividing or dividing more rapidly tend to lead towards a more aggressive cancer. And tumors that have less cell growth, um, which can be measured, they tend to be more indolent and they can last, they can go on forever and never really cause a problem. And you've probably heard people talk about, you know, prostate cancer, unlike most cancers, a good number of men who are diagnosed will never need to be treated because the treatment in many cases is worse than the actual disease. So what was found here is that looking at certain genes within the tumor, in, if they're turned on and they're expressed more and they're working more, that is much better indicator of how the tumor is than pathology or the PSA or even the, the, the rectal exam. And I like to think about it the way it is if you have two cars, you have two Ferraris and they're both bright red and you're staring and they look identical. And you see, you ask somebody, you know, ask a doctor or ask anybody, which one is the fastest? And you scratch your head and you say, why would you say that? They, they're the same. They're probably exactly the same. But what's important is not what it looks like. It's what's under the hood. And if you lift the hood on both of those Ferraris, one of them may have a 600 horsepower, you know, engine, and it's going to go very fast. But the one that looks identical to it, you lift the hood and there's two squirrels on a treadmill. And although they look identical, whereas that's the looking at pathology, they're very different. And the one with the squirrels is just going to putter along, but the one with the engine is going to be much more aggressive and much faster. And that's what this test was designed to, to look at is bypass what it looks like under the microscope and try to determine what is really driving that cancer. And we found that doing this test, it was twice as accurate in predicting what's going to happen with that tumor. 
Matter of fact, when we looked at the test, the Prolaris test, and we sub just kind of divided whether it was better than PSA, yes, it's better than PSA. Is it better than the pathology? Yes, it's better than the pathology. In fact, it's two times better than the PSA and the pathology combined. And we picked certain endpoints and you know to look at to, to predict. And the important things are these are endpoints that really matter. These are, are my, am I going to die from this disease? Is the disease going to spread? Because prostate cancer will never be fatal if it doesn't spread. No, and I, as I told people when I came to Myriad, I always told people, no one has ever died of prostate cancer, ever. You die of metastatic prostate cancer. So if you can predict who's going to be metastatic, you can predict who is going to need more aggressive treatment. So that's a really good way of looking at how you better treat these patients. And having tests like the Polaris identifiers and help us decide, one, even who needs treatment, and if they need treatment, you know, how aggressive that treatment uh, should be to actually make a difference. So what has happened over the years and with more study of this test, we've separated the test results into three different categories into men that have a lower Prolaris score who are good candidates for what we call active surveillance or watching. It's not to say go home, you're gonna be fine and come back if you're dying from prostate cancer. That's not what that means. It's an active process. And it's actually a form of treatment. It's gonna require intense follow-up and making sure that you're not gonna progress and it's not gonna go on and be a harmful cancer. Because the one thing that we have to be careful of is whenever we want to watch somebody is that we don't miss the bad cancer. So although the clinical factors, the pathology, the PSA and things may indicate that a patient is a good candidate to be on active surveillance, the Polaris test really helps us tell, you know, yes, they are good more candidates and we're going to keep them on active surveillance. But more importantly, it's going to identify those men that, those men that did not be on active surveillance who so are more likely to go on and progress because the biggest fear of putting somebody on active surveillance is that you're putting the wrong person on it. And that's one thing that kept me up at night until I had the availability of tests like Solara. Additionally, what it will show you is that is what's the right treatment? If you're not a good candidate for uh, active surveillance, should you be treated with just a single mode of therapy like surgery? or radiation and not adding anything to that? Or is it more aggressive and you're in that yellow category, what we call the multimodal area, where you're going to benefit from adding more intensive therapy? Because what we don't want to do is just give intensive therapy to everybody if it's really not necessary, because it's not without its side effects and quality of life issues, as some of you guys you know, may already know or have heard. So many studies that were done uh, to develop these thresholds with thousands of patients to make sure we're doing this right and that they actually work. And the active surveillance one in particular, that study showed that none of the patients that were studied with Prolaris that were in this active surveillance portion died from prostate cancer, not one patient. So it was a really good thing to, to be able to have a, a good sense to say to somebody, if you're in that area, we can feel very comfortable watching this and keeping an active role in it. And if it should progress or it seems to be, or you just decide I can't do this active anymore, it's, you know, psychologically it's hurting, um, go ahead and get treated. But it's really helped those men who would otherwise not benefit much from treatment to feel assured that they don't need the treatment. In fact, when we looked at this, we showed that men, when you just look at clinical, the PSA, the pathology, they only point to about 42% of men who could possibly be on active surveillance. When we applied then the Polaris to this group of men, we found additional men that have very indolent disease and what it looked like under the microscope didn't really correspond well to how the tumor was reacting. In fact, in the same group, 42% of men by clinical characteristics would qualify to be on active surveillance, but nearly 70% of those same men from that same group would qualify based on their Polaris test. So it was really a, a good way to say, 
yeah, it may look like a Ferrari, but it's got two squirrels under that hood. And it's a very good and very, very reassuring for men that they're not going to benefit much from some pretty significant treatments with lots of side effects. Uh, when we compared our test looking for specifically at active surveillance with other tests that are on the market, um, especially in men that would normally qualify for active surveillance, it was found that the Polaris test found more and was more secure telling patients that, yes, you are a good candidate, uh, where some of the other tests that are designed to do the same thing in men that would typically be good candidates for active surveillance, they only identified about half of those men. So you kind of were at a coin flip after you had your biopsy to see if you were really a good candidate based on those molecular tests, where Polaris identified nearly 90% of men that really should be on active surveillance. So it really showed in this group of men, it's a very good test. Uh, the question then comes up, if you're going to put men on active surveillance based on Polaris, is it safe? Or, are these, or is this going to be like a wolf in sheep's clothing? And what was found in another study is that based on a Polaris test, greater than 80% of men decided to go on active surveillance. And of those men that went on active surveillance, greater than 99% of them after two years, and actually we have longer data on this, almost four years, one person had problems um, afterwards. So it was well over a thousand men and one guy had problems. So we were saved over 990 men from getting active treatment because they had no advancement of their disease. So the test was very good. You know, obviously you're going to think of, well, if that was, if I was that one man, that would be a problem. But yeah, but in, you know, when you're looking at odds, if you're putting a, if you're bet on anything, you probably take the odds of 999 times out of a thousand, it's going to go your way. There was a very good finding in the study that this test showed that it was safe. As, as important, if nothing else, uh, was to show that it really works in a real world situation. So let's look at a specific patient and see what happens. This is a typical gentleman who's diagnosed with prostate cancer. 65 year old man, PSA slightly above five. Clinical stage, that means you know what it feels like in the rectal exam. And in this case, didn't feel anything. So this was diagnosed based on PSA. Um, and the, his, uh, I'm sorry, is there a question? Oh, okay. Um, the pathology was found and it was a Gleason three plus four, um, which we qualify then as what we call favorable intermediate, um, which is kind of right in the middle of progressive based on his clinical characteristics. So if you're talking to this gentleman, and, and if I saw him in my office, uh, there's a whole gamut of different treatment options that are available to him, including active surveillance and moving up through radiation therapies of different kinds, and re including removing the prostate with or without removing lymph nodes. But let's see what happens now when we apply, and this guy had a Polaris test. From his test findings, he was found to be in this active surveillance area. So it turns out that this guy, if we do nothing and just watch him, and what, that's what we call conservative management, that his chance of dying from prostate cancer statistically is 1.7% in in, over a 10-year period. Now, I did say before that nobody that was in this active surveillance group died of prostate cancer, and that's the case. So how do we get 1.7%? It's statistics. Um, and statistics don't really work when you talk about one person. They work if you talk about a thousand people. So if a person is a thousand people, then 1.7% of the time he may go on. But if he's one person, it's not going to happen. So that's why the problem with, we get with statistics and why it doesn't always sound the same or correlate to what we actually find when we compute something or calculate it, what we find in a real world setting. And real world studies are so much better because they tell you what really happened. So this is a guy who's a great candidate for active surveillance. Um, the Polaris score, pretty low, which shows that it's not an aggressive cancer. When we look at what's the chances of things going on with this gentleman, we saw that his chance of dying of disease, if we do nothing and just watch with so no active treatment, he has a 1.7% chance of dying from prostate. 
We also said before that the chance of developing metastatic disease is important because you have to get metastatic disease if you're going to die from prostate cancer. And the chance of him developing metastatic disease over 10 years is only 0.6%. So it's very low. And all this can be found in that time and you can affect a change um, by, if you see progression of disease, you can affect it. But even if you, if you operate or radiate this gentleman, the chances of him developing metastatic disease is still incredibly small in the future. So this is a, an interesting graph and sometimes it's a little complicated, but what's to think about here is if you look at the different on the vertical here, you see where it says very low, favorable, intermediate, unfavorable. These are different characteristics or risk category. And there are basically four risk categories that we look at. The triangles tell us what is the average risk of either dying from disease or developing metastatic disease in these different risk categories. That's about if we look at all the men that have ever had this test done. Then we look at the individual and we see by this, the little man icon here, that's this patient, the one we just talked about. And he's far to the left of that triangle, which means compared to other men with his same risk category based on clinical parameters, he's got a much lower risk. So he's better off than the guys that are just like him. So if you had a thousand guys like him, he's better than the average guy and much less likely to have a problem. So let's move on. Before I move on, anybody have any questions or anything you want me to go over a little bit more? All right. Hang on. So well, let's look at men that are good candidates or are likely to be candidates for active treatment. And there was another study that you know, showed this, and it really was designed to see who needs treatment, and if they need treatment, how aggressive should that treatment be? And we call this our single versus multimodal threshold. So if they're above this threshold, they have much more aggressive disease. And if they have much more aggressive disease, they would benefit from intensifying the therapy. The men in that single modal character category, even though you can give more intense treatment, it's not going to be that helpful. So the question is, just because we can, should we? And the answer is no. You really shouldn't. If it's not going to add benefit, it's not going to prolong your life. What you're doing is you may give a tiny bit of improvement of a chance, you know, of survival, but it's so much smaller than the side effects or the downsides of that, whatever that second treatment or that additional intensified treatment may be. So look at this. This is the science part. And what's probably most important is looking at the graph on the right side. And there's two curved lines, and these are called risk curves. The blue curve is if men had just one single therapy. And the red curve is if they've had multimodal therapy. And you can see here on that bottom, when it gets to about a little bit over two, those curves start to separate. And what that's telling us, if you're above this number two there, where you can see the kind of the dotted vertical line, if you're above that, the chances of you developing you know, metastatic disease is much higher if you've had single therapy than if you've had multi or more intense therapy. So that giving multimodal therapy to the people above that threshold really improves their chances of developing metastatic disease. And the contrary to that, if you go to the left of that, those curves come together, which show that there's a minimal improvement, if at all, of um, improving their chance of getting metastatic or, you know, developing metastatic disease by treating with single versus multi. So you're not really getting a benefit. So the question is, if it's not going to help, why do it? And just, and again, I'm a firm believer in just because you can doesn't mean you should. All right. When we look at different studies and different ways of looking at this, we look at in particular, giving radiation, should we add hormonal therapy? Hormonal therapy can be a terrible, I give terrible side effects. Um, weakness, decreased libido, um, 
bone problem, all sorts of cardiac issues. So the, what we try to find with this study is if we use the Prolaris test, can we identify men who are not going to benefit this? So we don't give it to them, even though the guidelines or what we, it, the past says we should give this, should we really give it? It's not going to help them that much. Uh, because if we can avoid giving um, hormone therapy, in addition to radiation therapy, you're going to save a lot of problems. Because I can't tell you one guy that I've treated that took this that liked it. It's miserable. We also looked at men at different risk categories to see if this threshold worked. So if they, if they had not very aggressive, all the way to very aggressive tumors, if they're in this single modal, does it work there as well? And the answer is yes. It doesn't matter what risk category you stick a person in based on their clinical parameters. When you apply the Prolaris test to it, if they're below the threshold, it didn't need extra treatment or it wasn't going to help them. And if they're above the threshold, it really helped prevent them from developing metastatic disease. So let's take another example. Um, this is another gentleman, different than the first. A uh, typical patient, he comes in, PSA is a little higher than the last guy, about 6.7. Uh, clinical stage, which says they're T2A, which means you can feel a little bump, a little nodule when you feel the prostate. The Gleason score, the pathology, a little bit higher. Now, before, you may remember it was a 7, but it was a 3 plus 4 7, which is very different than a 4 plus 3. Whatever the first number is that you're adding together, um, when you look under the microscope, it's a pattern. That first number is the predominant pattern. It's more than 50% of what you're looking at in the microscope. So if it's the first number is higher, you put that in, and if that's what the predominant pattern is, that makes a difference on how aggressive the cancer may be. So this guy, compared to the last guy, who was favorable intermediate, this gentleman is unfavorable intermediate based on his clinical parameter. So for this guy, typically active surveillance, not a good option because he has much more, he has more aggressive tumor. So the, but, so, but there are, again, a whole slew of different potential treatment options. The question is, what's the best one? And uh, what doctors want to do, they want to treat the best treatment to give the best chance of cure with also limiting the side effects as best possible. So this gentleman also had a Polaris test, and we'll see where that came out. So although his clinical parameters were only slightly worse than the first guy, his molecular test showed that he's in this multimodal category or much more aggressive which you wouldn't necessarily know just by looking under the microscope or looking at his PSA, still fairly well. So this is a guy that's gonna benefit from multimodal treatment. His Polaris molecular score, higher, much higher than the last man. So it shows that the, the genes in there are turned on. This cell, this, this tumor is, is really progressing faster and moving faster, so it's gonna require more aggressive treatment. Just like we split it out from the last gentleman, um, unlike the first one who was in that active surveillance category and his chance of dying from disease is only 1.6% or 7%, this gentleman has a chance of dying from disease, if you, do, if you just kind of watch it, of over 13%. So it's more than a six-fold more aggressive cancer than we dealt with with the first man, despite it not looking that much different under the microscope with the clinical parameter. He also has a much higher chance of developing metastatic disease. We remember from the first gentleman, it was 0.6%. This is 16%. It's a huge difference between the two. So you can see how that goes. So this is a much more aggressive cancer. When we look at it plotted like we did on that with the first gentleman, we can see here, he's in the unfavorable intermediate, but rather than being far to the left, which shows he's more aggressive than the average, which is depicted by the triangle, he's much further to the right. And he's much more aggressive than the average guy that has similar clinical parameters uh, to himself. So again, a much more aggressive tumor that you would never pick up how aggressive this is just by looking at his clinical features. So we have a, a, a group as, 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 you know, to avoid the pun, but there's a myriad of different tests out there. 
And the Polaris test is just one of them. The Polaris will tell you, is active surveillance safe? If it's not safe, then how aggressive should the tumor be? Or should the treatment be? There are other tests that are available also, different molecular tests, and these are more genetic tests that are based on uh, family history, heredity, that are passed down. So it's not really a characteristic of the tumor itself. It's the genes that you inherited from your parents. Unfortunately, we can't pick our parents. We can't pick our genes. We, we're stuck with them. And uh, until they can change those genes, um, we have to we can use those to determine who may develop a more aggressive tumor, even though the tumor today may not be aggressive, who may explode later on. And these are hereditary genes that we look at. And we can use these now together with tests like Prolaris to really help you know, decide what are the best treatment options for every individual that is diagnosed with prostate cancer. And also if they're going to be good candidates for other more advanced forms of treatment, should they unfortunately go on and develop more advanced disease like metastatic disease. So there's a whole bunch of tests that are either available now that weren't available when I was starting my career off. Um, they weren't available when my father developed prostate cancer. I uh, wish they were, but they weren't. And it would have really helped probably his treatment um, because he was miserable after his treatment. Um, and we hope we, we can avoid all that and really individualize treatment for every person based on their genetics um, whether they're inherited genetics or genetics of the tumor. So we can really do precision or personalized medicine, which it's really what it's coming to. And I believe that in the not too distant future, every individual's treatment will be specific for him or her. So I'm going to stop there um, and ask if anyone has any questions, would like to describe, would talk about um, anything that they have. Um, or go over anything in more detail, I'll be more than happy to do that. Um, if anything that I said either was confusing or you like something more clarification, um, I'd be more than happy to do that as well. Or if you want to discuss any other issues about prostate cancer, because I treated thousands of men with it. Um, and um, was I always right? I always like to think I was. I probably wasn't. My wife tells me I'm wrong about everything. So I just have to live with that. So but, but more than happy to answer any questions for you. Well, this is extremely interesting. I was actually thinking about, I, uh, I went through a radical prostatectomy five years ago and um, my initial diagnosis, I, I don't think I ever got over a five and a half on my PSA and I was initially diagnosed three, three. I did a year of active surveillance with only the PSA test but at the uh, end of that first year, I had a second spot and the first spot was more aggressive and it was decided at my age, I was only 49 at the time, mm -hmm. that uh, the rad radical prostatectomy was probably the best option, the uh, robotic assisted down here in uh, Celebration, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking uh, as you were putting up some of those numbers, I was looking at my uh, actual pathology report and I was actually a PT3A on... Um, on the pathology mm -hmm. and um, with a Gleason three, four. And so uh, I think I made a good decision getting it out at that point, but uh, I would have been interested to see what that test would have shown me when I did it initially. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot there, you know, not to go into too much of the science. There's a lot of studies, obviously about prostate cancers, thousands of them. And, you know, some of them show that, you know, your findings at radical prostatectomy, uh, dependent on a lot of factors, will kind of give you an idea of what's gonna, what could happen in the future. Um, the, the molecular studies actually, before and after radical prostatectomy, because you can do it on the, on the surgical specimen, um, can be more helpful, also very, uh, also very helpful in determining what's the likelihood it's gonna come back and you may need it. Or also, if it does come back, how aggressive should that we call salvage treatment thing? So there's a lot of there's a lot of good evidence with a lot of these tests to, to help those kinds of decisions as well. Um, right. And the most important thing, really, though, is you know, although the PSA test is not a great test for screening or the, you know looking at prostate cancer, it's actually the best screening test there is for any kind of cancer. 
But more importantly, it's the best test out there and simple test to see if a cancer is coming back. Um, that is the best use of PSA. So, you know, for anyone that has been treated, that is what you want to hang your hat on. And, you know, they have all these different tests that are coming out. Uh, they're genetic, they're this, they're that, and they're thousands of dollars, but none of them are better than your $19 PSA that you can get once or twice a year. So, you know, keep a very close eye on that, regardless of what kind of treatment you had, because that's your first signal. And um, I do run into a lot of men that quote from their doctors and from the VA in the past that, oh, the PSA has a lot of false positive and we don't want to recommend it because unnecessary treatment. And, I, and my response is always, yes, you are right, kind of. I said, it is a problem if it's a false positive and you run right down and have a radical prostatectomy the next day. I said, what it needs to be is there needs to be a very uh, methodical process. Of, let's confirm that because high PSA doesn't necessarily mean cancer. So let's confirm or deny that you have cancer. And then let's determine that your severity, your age. You know, at 49, I was my urologist felt like I was too young to try to do the radiation and all that stuff. He goes, just, just get it out and be done with it. And, you know, my doctor was very confident that I was going to be fine. And next month is my five year clear anniversary. So, um, yeah, but, my, tell. Big, but my biggest point That's is I was 49 going in for a flight physical. I was very healthy. I was, I, I had nothing wrong with me. I felt great and found out that I had stage three prostate cancer. So I said, yeah, it's not the best test, but, you know, your next it's indication best, yep. will be it's metastatic. the best one there is. Yeah, I'm with you. I was 50 years old and went and saw my doctor, and my cholesterol was perfect. I had nothing wrong with me except for my blood count was through the floor. And I was just like you, diagnosed with a bone marrow abnormality that almost let, you know, which I've been able to hold off my bone marrow transplant for 10 years now. So like you, there's good screening tests and you got to be, um, you know, diligent in following those. Um, I think that in 2012, the, the government panel that looks at screening tests came out and said PSA is useless because what, well, just what you said, Chris, that, um, too many people are diagnosed and a lot of people don't need to be treated. So no one should be screened anymore. And what it, yeah, I know you're, you're like, you're, you're laughing about that. The problem is they're right. A lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of unnecessary things that were done, but we know better now. And we can identify men that don't probably need to have aggressive treatment through tests like this and others. But what happened is that message got out. People stopped screening. And what we're seeing now is the ramifications of that, where we're seeing more aggressive disease because we're diagnosing it later. And it could have been, and a lot of them are uncurable, um, that are, they're metastatic when we find them. And we, we never saw that before. I mean, yes, sure. Before we had PSA back in the 60s and 70s, um, and, uh, you know, the only way to diagnose it was feel it. And if you generally, if you felt it, it was almost too late in most cases. So we're finding most of them by PSA now. Uh, not that it can't be cured, but a lot of them are. And that's when prostate cancer is a very deadly disease um, because we found them so late. All these ones that we're finding by PSA these days, you know, we're, you know, for a while we were treating everybody. And, you know, I, I was too in the early 2000s. I, you know, somebody came in and they had one, one little piece positive of a low Gleason score. We take out the prostate. Then when they came back 12 or 15 years later and the PSA is still zero, they walk in, I look it back and with their pathology as I put my head in my hands and I go, what did I do? You know, <laughs> it, but you only can do what you're with the technology that you have. And as it's improving, the important thing is, and what I try to stress to my colleagues, cause I'm just, I'm 60 and you know, the average urologist is a 59. Um, so they're like me. Um, not as good looking, uh, of course, but they can't all be, <laughs> but, um, but they're my age and they've been doing stuff for so long. So incorporating things like genetics into their practice, they're like, why, 
I had great results. Yeah, you might have had great results, but you get even better results now. The technology is there and we need to embrace it. Um, and I think that's a message that still slowly getting out there because people don't, you know, you, you, you want to use all the information you have because, you know, we're still dealing with people's lives. I read an article this morning in the news and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up after this. <laughs> this is exactly what you just said, that because of the message that's gone out over the last 10 years or so, they're actually seeing the rate of uh, metastatic cancer is now increasing in men because yep. they feel like for about a five, 10 year period, everybody's like, I'm not going to do a PSA. The urologist adds useless. They're not catching it. They were, then they went down. And so they actually are seeing this uptick in metastatic cancer. So. Yep. And it's true. I, I can tell you that I, you know, I, before I went into uh, the enjoy myriad, I ran a practice. I had, we, I ran a group of 38 urologists and we tracked those kind of things. Um, and we saw that we could see, you know, we see what is the stage of their diagnosed. And we saw it tick up every year past 2012. And that's scary. Um, and it's, it's not because the, you know, the men don't want to get screened. It's they were the doctors were told they they spin screen for prostate cancer. And a lot of insurance companies stopped paying for screening. So they just didn't do them. Um, that's changed um, significantly it's back to where it was, which is a good thing. If I may, uh, if I may, um, back in 2015, I was uh, I was diagnosed and I had a radical prostatectomy. Um, and uh, then in 2019, my PSA doubled and I brought the numbers and I spoke with uh, my uh, urologist and, and I said, something's going on. Um, and then uh, it was it was found that it did. I did have a oleometastatic um, one spot on my hip, uh, which the, I got radiation treatment for. And in addition, um, the hormonal um, treat, treatments uh, and uh, anti-antigen stuff. And um, so that that's been that worked out pretty well. And with the results that you mentioned. Uh, the the negative results from the hormone situation and 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 the cardiac situation with AFib and and then also exacerbated with COVID nineteen, which 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 is another move another moving part in this this this. Oh, yeah. Um. So so um, my question to you is um, the um, you mentioned the um. The BRCA analysis, CDX, and the yep. my risk uh, mm -hmm. test yeah. um, uh, for germline mutations or something to that effect. Correct. Could, yep. could you could you talk about that for us guys that um, are in those advanced stages? What 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 in, what do we need to know about that? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and and I'm glad you're doing well. That's you know. I'm sorry you went through the hormone therapy because it, as you know it. Things. Um, okay, so the, the yeah, yeah, that's why we're trying to find the guys not to do it on. Um, the germline testing is hereditary. Uh, germline really means you know how it got passed down. So you you can look at different ways of, of examining um, the genes. Uh, tumor is going to be it, it, or cancer is caused by mutation in genes. And mutations can be spontaneous where nothing causes them, and they're because of an of a defect um, that you're born with in the gene, and that's a germline mutation. Um, usually, it takes you. You may be born with one mutation, like from either your mother or your father. It's unlikely that you know you get one from each and have two of these. That's very uncommon. But then something happens, and you get what we call a second hit. Um, and in some cases, not only in prostate cancer, but in like lung cancer, it could be smoking or bladder cancer could be smoking, those kind of things. So germline testing, though, will tell us what is the likelihood that this cancer at some point is going to develop resistance to normal treatment or it's going to become more aggressive. And I, I, mean, I kind of alluded to that earlier. It could be a ticking time bomb. Because what you, what you find today is what the tumor is doing. 
So let's say we get your, you get a biopsy and you have a tumor. And even if you run a Polaris test, it tells you how aggressive that tumor is moving today. And let's just say it's not aggressive. It's a six, but it's, a, it's really low on the Polaris score. Um, but you have a genetic mutation, a germline mutation that you're born with. That means that whatever cancer may be caused by that genetic mutation is, if it happens, is going to be a much more aggressive cancer. Now, in prostate cancer, with having a germline mutation, that only becomes active to cause prostate cancer about 20% of the time if that mutation is there. That's the same gene, the BRCA gene, that we use for breast cancer. And that's what the BRCA is named after, is breast cancer gene. Now, it's different in breast cancer. If women have that gene, 80 plus percent of the time, they'll develop pre uh, breast cancer and a lot of times, maybe half the time, they develop ovarian cancer. So it's a much more aggressive in women to manifest as breast or ovarian cancer than it is in men, which is why even if a guy has a, a genetic or hereditary mutation, you're not going to say, well, we should take your prostate out. Even though you don't have cancer, you may get cancer. Uh, not a good idea because it's in a bad spot. It's really, you know, for those of you who had surgery, you know the, you know, the potential downsides. Of, of taking out a prostate, you know, and cup to incontinence and the rectal dysfunction and, and, you know, things, it could be, it's nasty. Um, so the, what's happening now, what we're finding with these germline mutations is that specific germline mutations make people more likely to respond to certain treatments. So uh, not necessarily the hormonal treatments, but there's other newer drugs that are being developed that are specific to patients, to people that have germline mutations, or, or in some cases, even if the tumor has developed mutations. Um, if they don't have these mutations, these drugs won't help. Um, so that's when we're talking about precision medicine. Even for advanced cancer, we're going to find either certain medications or combinations of medications because of a specific gene abnormality um, will be better for, for treating and more likely to either cure the cancer or at least prolong the spread and the growth of that cancer, slow it down. Um, so. so so the 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 exposure that I had in Vietnam with the Agent Orange and et cetera, et cetera, uh, it exacerbates the situation if I have um, if I have the the genetic mutation possibility too. Right. Yes. There there, there are certain causes now um, yeah from all the studies have been done. Yes, absolutely. Agent Orange has been shown to increase the risk of prostate cancer. Now, whether that's, you know, and I'm going to guess here because I don't know, and I don't, I haven't seen any recent studies that show this. But if you've had, if you're born with the mutation, and you're exposed to Agent Orange, you're probably much more likely to develop cancer, in this case, prostate cancer, than if you weren't born with the mutation, because you have to have two bad genes that cause a problem. If you have mm -hmm. one bad gene, that other one can usually take, take over. Um, and if you have, why, right. Yeah, but if, you have, if you're born with one and you're exposed to something like Agent Orange, you may knock off your good gene and the cancer starts. Um, whereas people, you know, there's obviously, there's a lot of people that are exposed to Agent Orange that never develop cancer. Right. Um, they may not have had, and it doesn't have to be the BRCA, it could be something else. We haven't discovered all the genes that are involved. Um, there are a lot of them, and we just don't know enough yet about, and you know, especially in prostate cancer, where, gosh, every everybody's prostate cancer is different. Um, it's amazing how how much different people respond to treatment. Um, you know, they you know don't progress, and all of a sudden they just explode. And you know, I always tell the story that, you know, I had a gentleman years ago that I put on actress or Ellen. He never had a Polaris test because before that was done. And he was fantastic for eight years. Every, he'd come in every six months, we'd get a PSA, and he and I would go out for lunch. And, um, and then we just kind of chit chat, and that was it. We'd see each other every six months. And he, his PSA was five for eight years. And he came in one day just for his social visit, and we had plans to go to lunch, and his PSA was 55. So I just assumed it was a lab error. No. You know, he had metastatic disease all over his body. He went from five in over a six-month period 
developed metastatic disease and died in six months. Now, I treated thousands of men over my career. I don't remember many of them. I can't remember my, my wife's name and my daughter's name half the time, but I know his name and I know his phone number and I know his wife's name and I know his three kids. I know where they live. I know his address. And I will never forget that because, you know, I feel like I missed it. And I wish I had some of these tests that were available. And every day, I, that day goes by, I don't think about him. So I think that to have these tests available to really help us better treat and better diagnose, you know, each individual, because Mr. Pollock, you're not a thousand people. I can't treat you like I would treat everybody else that's just like you. I want to treat you. And we're getting closer. We're not there, but we're getting a lot closer. And tests like Polaris and the, the other hereditary things, it will help us get there. Um, there's still a lot more work to be done. And, you know, we're, we're you know, I hate cliches, but they usually work. We're just at that visible part of that iceberg. The rest of it's below the surface. We just haven't had seen it yet. Bill, have they given you a specific at the v, at the Veterans Administration? Have they given you a specific uh, disability related to Agent Orange exposure and its consequential prostate cancer? I'm a hundred percent. Yep, you deserve it. Yep, I'm a veteran also. Uh, I like to weigh in a minute. I've been listening to everybody. I came in a little late. I apologize for being late. Uh, uh, I, uh, I'd like to share my story. Like I said, I was diagnosed in, uh, when I was 47, very similar to the gentleman to my left here. Uh, he, she said his was, he was 48, 40, 49. Anyway, I did a watchful waiting on mine. Well, let me, let me go back. Uh, I was all set to do radical prostatectomy and I decided to do to go to another doctor and, and uh, check. Uh, and I went to another doctor. The doctor decided that, uh, he said, well, I'm going to do my own biopsy. So he did a biopsy. First, my biopsy was very minimal. And th they were all set to, to do the radical prostatectomy, which I never liked the word radical. So that kind of <laughs> that kind of threw me off. Uh, so um, I actually went, uh, went to this other doctor and I too, like I indicated before, I'm a Vietnam veteran and I went to uh, this other doctor and he was the head of the, uh, the urology department uh, in DC. Uh, and uh, he said, I want to do my own biopsy. He did his own biopsy. He came back with, now this is his exact words and I never, never will forget it verbatim. I can tell you exactly what he said. My wife and I, my wife worked at the Pentagon and I went over to have lunch with her at the mall there, the Pentagon mall. We were sitting having lunch and he called me. We didn't have cell phones. They had a beeper. I had a beeper. He beat me and I recognized his phone number. So he had done the biopsy and this was, I was, I was waiting for the results. The results came. I went to a phone booth and called him back. He answered, they put him on the phone. He said, Mr. Uh, DePauler, uh, there are some gray areas but it's it's benign and i would suggest that you continue to watch it and we'll we'll revisit it again in six months so at that point i went on and i kept going back back and forth i did active surveillance or lack of for lack of a better term either active surveillance or uh what's the other one watchful uh, waiting Watchful yeah. waiting. Back in those days, it used to be watchful waiting. It's now <laughs> active surveillance. I yeah. tend to get them mixed up a little bit. But anyway, so I did this. I was, again, I was 47 years old. I did this until I was 66 years old. My PSA never went over. It was right, right about at four. But, and there were a few spots that they found. But again, he said his words were, there were there are some gray areas, but it's benign, and let's just watch it and see what happens. So this went on until I was 66 years old. So you guys can count. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a long time. But it, and when it started to move, it moved from four something to five something. Like the other gentleman spoke, 
But now this time, when I went to get a a, a um, when I went to get a uh, a biopsy, my biopsy was five point eight. So now I'm now hey, I, mine's really to me, mine's really taken off. It's well beyond four. So it's this this created some cause for concern for me. So now I said to myself, I said, okay, well, let's go back to this doctor and see what he's talking about. So his thing was he wanted to do, he's a, you know, uh, um, surgeons, I found out surgeons want to do surgery. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the oncologist or, or for lack of a better term, the, the, uh, the other guys that, that have the uh, radiation and what, what do you call them? The on- are they oncologists? Radiation oncologist. Yeah. Right. Ra- there you go. Radiation oncologist. So, I went to six different therapies before my wife and I decided which one we were going to do. We're ready to do, I'm ready to do something by now. I'm ready to do something. It's taken off. To me, it's taken off. So we go to one doctor and he says, well, one doctor, I had one doctor that I wanted to see down in Georgia. And, uh, and he said that he wanted me to, 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 to send all my information that I had gotten from all the other doctors to him. I gave it to him. He's, and he's the only doctor that told me that he could cure my, he could give me a cure rate. Out of the other five doctors, no other doctor could assure me a cure rate. I'm looking to be cured. I'm not looking to be treated. I can get anybody to treat me. I want to be cured of this dreadful disease. So, and I said, well, doc, tell me this. How do you determine what my, what my cure rate is going to be? He says, well, since I've been doing this since 1974 and I have people that work for me in a big building and once the people are treated, by the way, I had radiation and seed implants. That was my, my breaker therapy and this, uh, and the uh, seed implants, of course. So then, then, uh, he says, I've got people that I employ and we've been doing this for a number of years. So they send all their data back to me and that's how they determine, in fact, how how he's going to give you a cure rate. So he gave me an 85% cure rate. And I said, hmm, that's pretty good. No, none of these other doctors. One doctor said, I asked him, I said, can you give me a cure rate? And he says, he says what's this other doctor telling you he can do for you? I, says, uh, I said, 85%. So he goes, well, I can give you 90 or 87%, 88%. I said, I told my wife, I said, come on, let's get out of here. I don't want to have time to fool with this guy. He wants to play games. I don't have time to play games. That's what he was just merely telling me that he could give me an 88% just because I could get an 85% from a bona fide person that had something legitimate to, to, to hang his hat on, whereby this guy had, he was playing a game with me and I, I didn't have time to fool with that. But anyway, I went down there and, and I was treated and now I'm 0.1, uh, 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 it's been like that since night, since, uh, 2014, I was treated in 2013 and I am again, a v- Vietnam veteran and, uh, and I am a hundred percent, but not for, not for, not for prostate cancer because mine went in remission. Once the VA says yours goes into remission, you don't get the hundred, you get, you don't get to keep the hundred percent. You get the, they're going to snatch it. I know guys that they snatch it down to 10%. I wouldn't allow them to snatch mine down. They took it down to 60%. That's the best you can get. And that's what I have. But my 100% is for PTSD. Because I don't care what anybody says. It wears the fact that you've got prostate cancer wears, especially if you're a Vietnam combat veteran like I am. It wears on your psychic. And oh you know, yeah, it, 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 I don't care what anybody it, 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 it has. And I said to myself, what in the world is going on here? I, I can't have prostate cancer. That, 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 that's beyond me. But anyway, it bothered me so much that I was going to the VA for PTSD. That's where my 100% is. I'm, I'm 100 for PTSD. But, um, and the 60, of course, for that, and the bilateral hearing loss, and a ho- host of other things. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I went to the VA, and I told them, I said, you know what? We need a prostate cancer group down here. And they said, well, we already got, we already got cancer groups. I said, I didn't say cancer groups. I said prostate cancer groups. I said, there's no veteran that comes back from Vietnam. I don't care where they come back from or whatever their case is. 
whatever their situation is, they don't, they should not have to be subjected to, to the feeling that I had as a combat veteran and being subjected to Agent Orange and, and, and exposed to Agent Orange and so forth. So I, I kept on them and I kept on them. And six years ago, I started that group and it's still going on. And every and biweekly we meet virtually and we have two or three guys come in. And I'm so glad that I was so persistent to do that. And it goes to show you persistence pays off. Sure does. I was adamant about that. And and uh, and uh, I, 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 I don't want to toot my horn so much, but if I don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. But I feel very confident that I see these two guys every bi-weekly coming in and they've got these questions and I can help them answer some of those questions. There was nobody to answer a question for me. You know, doctors will sit down with you and I make them sit still. I say, I don't care how many people in that waiting room. I got 10 questions. You need to answer these questions before I'm leaving up out of here. Do you understand that doc? Okay. Yes, sir. I do understand. All right. Well, <laughs> just close the door and sit down and let's talk. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of guys will go in these doctor's offices, they won't ask her questions. They don't, they, they rely on their brains. Like you said, you can't remember this. I can't remember, I can't remember half the things that's going on with me, but I got them written down. My mother, <laughs> mother used to always say, I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up. What my mother used to always say, I never forgot it. She said, a short pencil beats a long memory. And I'd write <laughs> those things down and I remember, and I remember to write them down. That's the m- most important thing. And thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, gentlemen, for letting me share my story. Well, okay. Harry, would you put your telephone number in the chat, please? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. Well, we're getting a little over eight. I want to keep this uh, somewhat on time. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to talk to Dr. Cohen about or any other general questions? Uh, I guess I do have a question. How uh, How is this test performed? Is it I, I I didn't catch that as a blood test or a... No, it's on the it's actually on the biopsy specimen itself. So okay. you know, once you have the biopsy, you some of it's got sends over to pathology that look under the microscope, and then the pathologist then sends it on to Myriad and they carve out the tumor. Um and they put those cells in and they look at the um the genes directly from that biopsy. So nothing more needs to be done. What we used to do at our practice is um we talked to men ahead of time and said, okay. If you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, do you want us to send this test off? So when I sit down with you, and Mr. DePolo, I want to address something that you said. Um, we'll have all the information, so we don't have to keep you coming back to tell you different things every time because some things can change. So what I would do is, you know, if they said yes, I would call them on the phone and say, you know, we got the results of your biopsy back. Um, Come on, and we're going to talk about it. And again, Mr. Paul, to your credit, um, I always did this at the end of the day. I said, tell them I may be 40 minutes late getting to you, but I'm going to stay until three in the morning if I have to, because I'm not going to leave this room if you have no que- until you have no question. And I always insisted people brought somebody with them. I didn't care who it was. It could be a neighbor, but you know, usually it's a, a spouse or a child. Um, you know, I always tell them, you know, bring, if you have a daughter, bring your daughter because most sons are useless and they don't listen like we don't listen. Guys are horrible patients. And, and, but the women are better and they ask more questions and they're, you know, they want to know. And uh, so, but I've spent three, four hours with people going over things because, you know, that's what it's all about. You know, you shouldn't walk out with questions. You should walk out feeling comfortable, you know, with the, with what we know and all the information that we have. So you can decide what's the right thing to do because it's a big decision. And the nice thing about prostate cancer is you have time to make that decision, even in aggressive ones that are newly diagnosed. So you can get all that information and, you know, come back and ask questions, get second opinions. Second opinions offend some doctors. It's silly. Um, You've got to feel comfortable. Part of the process of treatment is trust and comfort with the person that you're working with, with the doctor who's treating you. If you don't trust them, that doesn't help. I mean, I think there's a lot of psychological aspects to treatment and trust is one of them. And uh, you've got to do that. So I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> I put that link in the uh, chat box. If anybody wants to see that uh, Newsmax article about that, it's interesting. Something that should uh, motivate everybody to try to get the word out, get pro- PSA testing back 
um, front and center in guys' minds. One of the things that we've done, Dr. Cohen, is uh, we're actually putting out, BPCA is actually putting out a, a men's, well man's health guidelines. So like much like what women do every year, they have a little checklist of everything that we do, they do. Mm-hmm. We're actually putting out a checklist. And based on your age group, here's all the things you should be doing and how often with obviously PSA screening being a yearly thing, but yeah. <clears throat> even so much as cholesterol, testosterone, A1C, all the things that you need to, you know, and I argue with guys about that. I'm like, look, do you wait for the red engine check light to come on before you take your car to the shop or do you do preventive maintenance? So don't Make sure you get vitamin, put vitamin D on there too. We're actually now talking uh, about adding on different vaccines and vitamin regimen. So, Good. um, you know, I said, don't treat your car better than you treat yourself and take care of yourself. Well, we treat our pets better. We're sort of moving up from car to pets and then yeah, dent off. Definitely. So. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, any last rounds from the uh, group? Any questions or? Is this well, part more go. weekly, monthly? How does this work? Th- this is our monthly 50 vets in 50 states. Uh, it's going to be the last Tuesday of each month. And uh, we're going to have it like, like we're doing here. We'll have some type of guest speaker and a, a particular, we're, particular topic. We're, we're, where's, Bing, where's Bing tonight? Uh, probably somewhere over the Pacific Ocean heading to <laughs> Asia. So, <laughs> okay. I, but I do know he's in business class with email access because I'm still getting emails constantly. Really? <laughs> um, so we figured that out. But, yeah, that's one thing we'll be doing Uh uh, I'm sorry I got a little messed up tonight. Uh, we've switched over to a new media group and we're with using HubSpot as our um, as a distribution. And so we're still kind of uh, working through the growing pains of trying to learn that stuff. So uh, hopefully we'll get this a little bit. We really super appreciate you talking tonight, Dr. Cohen. That was a that was actually a very fascinating um, topic. Well, thank you for having me. Was, you know, and I'll, I'll talk to, to Mike out. about this. this. is definitely something we want to link on our website. As a, uh, as, you know, a possible diagnostic tool to add to our bag. So great. Uh, All right, guys. So we will Thank get a, a reminder for next month, correct? Yes. Uh, we'll, what we're going to do is uh, they'll, HubSpot will send, when we get the details, they'll send a HubSpot thing, and then that'll send out all the emails like you got tonight. And they'll just be correct. We had a little issue with uh, an old invite getting sent out. And so we had a little scrambling to get to make sure our guest speaker actually got the uh, invite to uh, to the meeting he was going to be talking at. So <laughs> but, uh, helpful. no problem. Well, thank, thank did you anybody everybody. did anybody uh-huh. see that? Did anybody see that? Excuse me for cutting you off. Did anybody see that Reuters uh, uh, article today? Somebody sent it to me. A decline in prostate cancer screening has been linked to subsequent increases in advanced cancers. Of yeah, that's, I put that in the uh, chat box. That came from uh, Newsmax. Oh, okay. I, I, somebody sent it to me from Reuters. R- 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 yeah, I'm sure people yeah. that know that we're involved in this are going to be sending you that. But oh, that's, okay. one of the, that's one of the primary things that BPAC needs to get out is, yeah. hey, it's not yeah. a perfect test, but you know your, your, next diag- your next indication of prostate cancer will be uh, a pain somewhere in your body from a metastatic issue. So let's mm. not do that. Too late. That's right. All right, All right. everybody. Have a good night. Uh, any other questions, please let me know. This is a recorded uh, 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 meeting tonight, so I think we're going to post that on the website uh, so people will be able to go back and look at it later. Oh, great. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Good thank night, you. everybody. Thank, thank you. you very much.